Are we there yet? Sun, beaches, and Latin-inspired flavors are what people around the world call their vacation paradise. We call it home. Welcome to the weekly podcast that captures it all, The Scoop on Miami. Let's discover and rediscover Miami together with Ernie Emad, a 54-year resident of the Magic City, and Miami native Lenny Rada on The Scoop on Miami. And now, here's Ernie Emad and Lenny Rada. Welcome to The Scoop on Miami, very close to 1 o'clock. Welcome aboard. We're here every single Friday around 1 o'clock at Scoop on Miami. We also become a podcast later in the day. Go to scooponmiami.com to see all of our podcasts, listen to our podcast, as well as go wherever you find your favorite podcast. I am Ernie Emad, the broker owner of One Premier International Realty, and today I'm standing alongside my co-host. Hi, I'm Lainey Rada, leading edge broker associate with Douglas Elliman. Fantastic. I know I had a great week and I know you had a great week. I saw that you also had a closing. So that's always adds an extra boom uh, to the <laughs> week. Um, that extra paycheck and uh, uh, being able to successfully service your customers. Um, anything else that you want to talk about before we move on? Well, I was looking at uh, plane fares, actually. And uh, I know that there's plane fare as low as $14. <laughs> It's incredible, but but you can't go out of the country. It's, it sounds really miserable. I looked at 12 countries you can go to, and every place you go, you have to be in quarantine for about two weeks, <laughs> so it's crazy. You're right, and uh, do you want to visit anybody that comes from out of town? Uh, you want to make sure that they're 14 days away. Uh, no question but about we, that. But the United States is so beautiful. There's so many things to see here, and I, I notice people are going around by their posts on Facebook and, and Instagram, so it's nice. Hey, look, some really good news uh, in real estate recovery index three florida cities now hotter than before the pandemic and uh, uh, tampa st petersburg area the orlando kissimmee sanford area and miami fort lauderdale um, as the inventory continues to shrink 2.8 months it's a great time to sell your home because there's insufficient uh inventories i know you had nine offers uh ended up selling for above the listed price and that's what's going on you just need a a, a professional to handle uh, um, the chaos um, that will ensue when you get yeah. multiple offers to navigate to be, through yep. that uh to keep you above uh, legal problems. That's and true. Yep. And finally, single family for sale inventory hits a record low. Uh, for those buyers that are thinking, let me wait. Um, let me tell you, not a good time to wait. Uh, interest rates did uh, peak up a little bit, uh, inch up a little bit this past week, still under 3%, still a great time to be able uh, to purchase. What is today's inspirational quote, Lainey? Uh, it's from Hugh Prather. And I'm not sure who that is. There's a time to let things happen and a time to make things happen. Um, yeah, I always like to make things happen. A um, <laughs> little impatient to let things happen, but sometimes we have to let things happen. You are mm -hmm. absolutely right. Um, let's talk about this wonderful segment that we kick off the show with, which is the Miami Rewind, where we educate and inform you and kind of give you a peek of how something got started here in Miami. Tell us about today's, which ties in. Go right ahead, Lainey. Well, I'm talking about uh, an institution here that was here uh, almost, let me see, it closed in 1985. So uh, I always say if these walls could talk, and we're going to talk to somebody who knows what, a lot of things about what the walls would say. Um, but we're going to give you a little background on the location. So let's go ahead now and go to Lainey Rada's Miami Rewind. It's time to take a look back with Lainey Rada. With Lainey Rada. Miami, Miami Rewind. Rewind. In 1969, a 12-story hotel owned by Burton Goldberg opened in Coconut Grove. There were 130 themed hotel rooms designed by Carolyn Robbins and her husband. What was so unusual was how opulent they were, with completely fabulous themes and names like Nautical Dreams, 
Moroccan fantasy, and shibui. They had Roman baths and mirrors on the ceiling. What was the most popular place to see and be seen in the 70s and early 80s was the two-story nightclub called The Mutiny. For members only, there was a metal membership card for $75 and an unforgettable winking pirate logo. There were license plates too. I only wish I saved either one. The CIA, drug traffickers, celebrities, and politicians all hung out in the same place. Many guests were under surveillance. The food was fantastic. The drinks were flowing to the point that in the late 70s, they sold more Dom Perignon than any other venue in America. It was even poured into the hot tubs. The stunning girls were called hostesses. They wore full length gowns and large hats. They rivaled Playboy bunnies with more clothes on. The club rivaled Studio 54 as one of the most desirable high-end destinations. I worked there for years. It's where I got to stare at Al Pacino when he came to study his character for Scarface on several nights. It's one of my favorite Miami memories. Oliver Stone and the cast was checked into the hotel for research. I watched those girls count thousands of dollars in tips every night. That was a time in history when a trace of cocaine was on 100% of all dollar bills in Miami. The word debauchery only brings me back to that time. Every movie and story I've seen on the era is always accurate. People love to talk about it and many can't believe what they see. There were a few fights in the 70s because everyone was armed. It was getting hot in there in the early 80s after the Marielle boat lift. When there were gunshots in the hall right behind me, I decided to work somewhere else. Goldberg sold the building in 1985 for $17 million. Years later, the property was rehabbed by a developer. It's sold as a condo hotel. It's a great location on Sailboat Bay at 2951 South Bayshore Drive. I've had listings there and you can barely get to the elevator without yeah. hearing people reminisce. The sales office who sold out the development got the bulk of the stories. It was an incredible experience. You can't go back, but you can find people who live to tell about it. That's the scoop. Let me tell you, so excited about this segment and uh, no question, Lainey, uh, you did a great job uh, with uh, the Miami Rewind and, and bringing back the mutiny. Uh, on the telephone right now, I'm going to let Lainey introduce our first guest today. Yes, Robin, we can hear you. Let me tell them who you are. Your connection, your connection is not very good, Lainey. Okay. Okay. Mm. All right. So what we're going to do is... Just dropping um, the call. Sorry. Oh, no, All right, it's okay. so it's fine now. You could hear us fine now, yeah. correct? Perfect. Okay. All right. Yes. Okay, perfect. Hi. Um, I'm just going Hi, to... Hi, how are you? I'm, I'm great. How are you? We, we just haven't introduced Ooh, I, you yet, so let everybody know who you are. Miami raised Robin Farsad hosts the show Full Disclosure on Public Radio. His 2017 true crime bestseller, Hotel Scarface, where cocaine cowboys partied and plotted to control Miami, documented the rise and fall of the mutiny, the infamous Coconut Grove Club and hotel that hosted all sorts of kingpins, spooks, celebs, cops, and bugs. He's a graduate of Princeton and the Harvard Business School. Follow him on Twitter and Instagram at Full D Radio. And here he is. How are you? I'm great. I'm excited to have you on our show. Thank you so no, much. Thanks for having me. <laughs> um, Thank you. Uh, you know, uh, the first time that we spoke, I had to, to confess to you that I'm very enviable that you wrote this book, and I always thought about doing this. And the biggest question I have is about how you did the research. I'm sorry, how I what? How you were able to do the research and get a hold of all these people that you wrote about in the book. Yeah. I made it an obsession of my life uh, since about, let's say, 1997 or 1996 when I realized that there was a chance uh, for me as an outsider. Actually, I grew up in Miami, but uh, I was journalistically an outsider. To The, the story seemed so much stranger than fiction <laughs> that... I made it, it was like I was a Captain Ahab Moby Dick moment. I really had to have it. <laughs> and so I started putting out feelers to people, many of whom, you know, you're familiar with the mutiny lady. They told me to go away. 
statute of limitations. Why would I ever want to talk to you? It was a private club. <laughs> but over time, I feel like with people, if you leave the door open and you show them that you're not there to do kind of the cheap story, oh, this is a whorehouse, blah, 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 some of the old trope about the place, then over time, the door the door is more and more open for you to come in. And um, I'm just so grateful that people let me into their lives kind of as an interloper to, to build this true story. Oh, that's uh, I know that it had to have taken that for sure, because a lot of the people that were connected to other people, you know, it was a, it was a kind of a close group that they would have been fearful and been very overprotective. So it's great that you were able to get those, you know, get through there. It's just yeah, and yeah. I mean the, the the story, even though the club, the the, the hotel was filed for bankruptcy in the mid eighties. And the scene has probably left, you know, Coconut Grove in the late 80s. Uh, the story still lingers. If you look in the news, some of the same habituaries of the place, uh, they only recently got out of jail. One, Willie Falcone was deported. Mm -hmm. So it is amazing to me that this story traverses kind of 50 years of Miami history. That was really why it was so appealing to me. It was it was kind of a lobby that, that led to all of, of Miami's coming of age. And, and about how many people did you gather for, you know, what are, what are the amount of people that you had to, to peel through and how long did it take you? I mean, there were, uh, you know, a couple hundred people. There are times that people wanted to speak on, um, on background. There were certain mutant girls who were being stalked or they led a certain life that they didn't want to lead on if their children, you know, some of these people morphed, morphed into born again Christians and uh, professionals and everything, and they didn't want coming out that they were dealing with dime bags or, mm -hmm. you know, working for the Moonflower Escort Agency. But I was grateful. I think when I when I showed people that, um, you know, I'm a serious investigative journalist and I'm not there to go, aha, uh -huh, I got gotcha, you, I found you, and I'm here to embarrass you. I think word got around and uh, uh, just breaking the story, if you will, telling the connected tissue of the story. was it, it started emerging to me about 10, 12 years ago when I realized I had enough to write this book. Mm -hmm. Every literary agent and editor would say, okay, so you have a gang of colorful characters. So what? I mean, there are lots of places in many cities that have that. But mm -hmm. when I realized with the help of all of these forces that this was the place that connected three generations of Cuban gangsters, um, you start with, you know, Pedro Pan and the CIA generation of the 50s and 60s, you, um, you know, you have uh, the, uh, the, the Mariel refugees, the old guard CIA people, and this is kind of where they met and asserted themselves and wrested control of Miami, and that was something that I think worked as, as a narrative backbone. Oh, good. Yeah. Um, I, that, I'm sure that, you know, with your background, your education, that it really helped put you on an... Well, on... I can't hear you, Lainey. Oh, okay. Can you hear me now? Well, I don't know yeah. why we're having a little trouble with that. Um, I'm sure that with your education and your background that it really helped you pull everything together. So I'm really happy for you that you got to do this because it, it had to have been super exciting. And still to this day, because you get to talk to people about it all the time. You're the source. I, I love talking about it. I wish the book was better received, frankly. The, the book tour and everything, it was all so brief. It was just this moment where people were talking about it. I thought it would be a bigger deal, actually. And the moment for me, the, the true moment, uh, was at the Miami Book Fair in the autumn of 2017, where it was a packed, standing room only crowd <laughs> where people showed up. There were cops. We did another event at Books and Books. And there are other times that I've showed up at, at empty rooms and everything. Um, what's amazing to me is the people who did not want to talk you think about Scarface as art imitating life. People who did not want to talk and Scarface was chased out of town in the early 80s. So many of these people boomerang back four years later after they kind of been forgotten by the headline. And they all inevitably say, you know, I was the inspiration for Scarface. You should be talking to me. <laughs> um, and that, I think, it, it's beautiful. Like, I could be on Coral Way uh, with, a, with an older person in two socks, you know, telling me about his days as a nefarious cocaine kid. <laughs> 
you know, it's funny because uh, Robin Ernie Emad, um, the, the, the characters, I read the book, well, I've read about 19 uh, uh, chapters this week and also have it on Audible. Um, it, it brought me back to so many memories from, I could remember specifically the day almost that McDonald's stopped um, yeah. with the uh, uh, coffee stores, right? And, oh, yeah. Uh, it was just an incredible, um, it seemed like Miami needed the uh, cocaine enterprise, whatever you want to call it, because they were a third of our economy at a time yeah. where interest rates were 18%, they were paying 20% in CDs. Um, and uh, I, right, you, you had mentioned about our um, uh, Fed being flush with $5 billion worth of surplus cash. And can you imagine what would have happened to Miami during those six years had we not experienced, we had lost that one third of the economy? Hello? Yep, we're here. Um, yeah, I mean, I think I think about it, and that's what one of the dopers said in closing. Is go, do you know where the skyline of Miami would be without this cocaine? And if you look at what Edna Buchanan said in the famous documentary Cocaine Cowboys, who do you think built this skyline? Like, who do you think, you know, real estate, mortgage, everything in Miami, a property, a personality, a um, a sports franchise. A bank is only one or two steps removed from kilos of cocaine. That's how formative this was to the, uh, the the founding of kind of modern Miami. And all you need to do is compare the skyline of 1980 to that <laughs> of today. It's, it's just unrecognizable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And can you imagine uh, with a recording studio next door and you have every every single element. We were talking to Laney earlier this week, the Seabold building here in Miami. We go there for jewelry where all of the drug business from all the different um, cartels and all of the negotiations took place around incredible movie stars, recording artists, even Linda Lovelace. And then you have Julio Iglesias that lived there. You had uh, uh, Tubbs, Philip, uh, Michael Thomas that uh, also lived there. It was just a, a wild time in Miami. Well, it was, I mean, a wild time in Miami and the South Beach right now is an international destination, right? And it's, the city has arrived. But it's if you still think wild. To back then, <laughs> if you think to back then, there was, you know, a couple of discos, what, on, on Four Away? Mm -hmm. There was the Alexandre and the Omni and there was Coconut Grove. Um, South Beach was a, was a derelict area. Mm -hmm. There wasn't really a revival of South Beach until the late 80s. So, And, by the way, this was next door to a major recording studio, Bayshore Recording Studio. So that brought in the Eagles and, you know, various other people. And, and that kind of combusted beautifully. Cocaine, celebrity, money, um, sex. That was, that was the era. That's where it all met. Yeah, we'll give a shout out to China. And, and let, yeah, let the, me tell the, you. The DJ, not, not China, the country. <laughs> I'm sorry, can you speak up? You're both, you're both, you're both breaking up. Okay, so um, without a doubt, um, we know the amount of cocaine that went through, the amount of Dom Perignon. It was really a sex hotel. Can you talk to us about those experiences that you were able to capture from your interviews? The experiences at the hotel? Yeah, yeah, correct. From, uh, from all of the drugs and all of the sex, because it was really a sex hotel. Uh, practically, I know yeah. that Burton would have called it a swingers hotel if he could have. Yeah, so it's interesting in that uh, one of the most poignant things that one of the Cuban uh, dopers shared with me, he said, for us to make it as Cuban, uh, to, to get time of day there from celebrity and gorgeous women and everything by the mid-70s, Not only did we feel like we arrived at Miami as refugees, but this for us was like a continuation of what Havana would have been if it wasn't ruined in 59 or 60. Mm. The party would have spilled into this. Like, you can imagine the Tropicana scene moving on mm -hmm. here. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I kind of felt by 1980 and by 1981, when Miami was a, you know, a failed state, that this was an oasis. Uh, this was a lush tropical paradise amid all the hell. One of the metaphors is uh, during the McDuffie riot in 1980, uh, people are in the hotel, there are orgies going on. Some people in their rooms are watching Mount St. Helens explode on the opposite side of the continent. And the, the signal is shaky on the TV because there are bullets hitting the antenna on the top of the hotel. 
<laughs> and so a bunch of dopers, a bunch of dopers leave a leave an orgy. They take to the roof. There are a bunch of uh, submachine guns stored in the champagne closet, and they start shooting at everything and nothing. And they go back downstairs and get high and start screwing around again. That is really a metaphor. Miami is burning. Miami's on fire, but everything's just lovely at the view. And all of the cottage <laughs> industries, right, from a call center aboard a yacht to take care of all of the escorts. It's incredible. Yeah. The Moonflower Escort Company, if you're on South Dixie, you know, US-1, and you're about to turn at Coconut Grove, I think there's a Poyer Tropical and a Shell gas station there now. Mm-hmm. There was a billboard about Moonflower Escort Company, which operated out of a yacht in Dinner Key, Tailboat Bay, you know, in front of the mutiny. And it was a dispatch system that, you can order any type of woman, any fancy you wanted. And these dopers are telling me that, look, it wasn't to them. It wasn't exploitative. These are girls who would be partying with us one night, and they'd be up, you know, working on another night. And this is nice. And you would order 100 bottles of Dom and a bunch of Moonflower Escorts, and there'd be ladles of blow. And uh, you just take over the floors and, and do it. And, uh, you know, Friday nights were for mistresses, and Saturday nights were for wives. And <laughs> never the twain had meet. That's what everybody told me. Mm-hmm. You know, it's funny because there was a, a, a Cuban song uh, that when people would see these, um, what looked like drug dealers in cafeterias, they all kind of talked the same, right? Um, with that raspy voice. And uh, yeah. uh, they would be driving these high-end cars. And we would always say, ¿Y qué lo que hace? No sé. It's like, what do you do? I don't know, <laughs> right? Because no one had a job back then. Oh, yeah. I mean, Carly Casada, the late Carly Casada, passed away last year, table 14. Um, he was a prolific cocaine dealer who plugged his phone into the bottom of table 14. And I do an impersonation of his voice, rest in peace. <laughs> I couldn't understand. Like, man, you've been in 1961. You've been indicted. You've been to several prisons. You can't understand. He's like, what are you talking about? I tell you. <laughs> and what's amazing to me is um, that. You know, when they bring him in front of uh, a court for TikTok, the big drug bust, TikTok in 1982, they ask him, what do you do? He's like, yeah, I have investments. I don't know. What do you think I do? <laughs> and they crib those lines exactly, I think, for Tony Montana, where he said, I'm going to go take care of my investment. <laughs> you know, yeah. it, it's, uh, it's really a case of art imitating life and vice versa. You saw another character, Mario Cabrali, was in the hit documentary, The Tiger King, on Netflix. Mm-hmm. And Many people, if you look at his photo, many people believe that he was the straight-up inspiration for Tony Montana. He had a yeah. chair at his mansion nearby with all the animals that said MT in the letters that you see TM yes. on his throne in the movie. Right. And so you could go back and backwards engineer what everybody looks like. And, you know, Lainey, all of the staff keeps telling me that uh, you know, De Niro, um, I'm sorry, Pacino and De Palma and Stone were so nice. Rocky Echevarria who would come in, who, you know, he was back in Capasa, USA, and this was his big break in movies, Michelle yes, Pfeiffer. he hung around there um, a lot. Mm-hmm. Really, yeah, and, and you see what's, what's a real indication to me, and I know I've really spent too much time on this, is anybody can pull up the screenplay for Scarface, mm-hmm. Oliver's own screenplay, which he part wrote out, and several times when he's supposed to cue the Babylon Club, he accidentally cues the beauty. Mm-hmm. And you also see in the Miami Herald that they tried and they failed to shoot scenes there because the Cuban Cuban drug dealers did not want that publicity. Mm-hmm. After 1981, you needed that like a bullet in the head, right? Right. Yes, for sure. No, I, I mentioned this in my, um, I, I write history segments for the show and I did mention that was one of my favorite things that I love to tell people because I just sat there staring at Al Pacino, who's one of my very favorite actors in life. <laughs> and I got to just stare at him while he was sitting there at the table a couple times for hours and hours, just, you know, getting his character reference. Uh, and I think um, people just don't believe that these things really happened. This was a daily life here. And the reason people had that raspy voice is because they partied all the time and did coke and smoked. And we didn't talk about uh, going to yoga and eating healthy food and being, you know, it was a totally different agenda. And who remembers, you know, I talk about raspy, but do you remember China Valley? Mm-hmm. Lady? Yeah, I mentioned him. Yeah, I said. The radio. Yeah, uh, because I mentioned. The radio DJ. The radio DJ at WTMI, which had, you know, back then, believe it or not, the mutiny was one of the tallest buildings. Mm-hmm. Coconut Cove, they put the radio station in there. And if you get the tape from some of his sessions in the late 70s and early 80s, and his voice, you can go back and hear it on YouTube. 
to mm-hmm. kind of balance stuff that you've got some great jazz. Mm-hmm. So there would be these long pauses in between <laughs> songs sometimes it was because he'd go down to his party. Yeah, I know. I used to see him because he'd come down to get something to eat. He'd hang around in the back of the kitchen. He'd it, hang around. And yes. then like, China, would you have a record playing? He's like, it's fine. Um, <laughs> you know, I wasn't able by the time he passed away, but he wasn't cogent by the time I was able to do this. I didn't, mm-hmm. wasn't able to reach out to his son. And you don't want to hurt people's legacies with no. their wife. Um, Right. He had he had a pretty a, he had a good reputation. Like, you know, he was a good guy, like everybody liked him. He was a likable person. Didn't cost trouble. The other bookend to that is that when there was a Marielle shootout in nineteen eighty three, which probably was Wichi Escovito, um, the the shootout, the gun that came out of it, you know, when the club was, was really kind of starting to go downhill, mm-hmm. it shot up through the wall and, and destroyed the typewriters at WTFI. I mean, fortunately nobody got killed. Mm-hmm. Yeah, my wife is from Minnesota, and during that time, um, that was all that uh, every single newscast started off with. Um, as you yeah. remember, they started off with all of the shooting, everywhere from Dadeland Mall to the Sunny Land. It was just a spray of bullets everywhere uh, back then. And, 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 who was, and who was at the bar at the mutiny every afternoon soaking himself in drink? It was none other than Ralph Rennick. <laughs> the voice of my enemy, the news chapter. And if you go and look at his desperate pleas, please take these refugees back. Open up the <laughs> gate. You know, it was, it was, um, it, it's fascinating. I think they're watching all of these people watch the place turn into a Marielle hangout. Characters like Coca Cola, Yero. And then by the time that was done and the scene had moved to cats and regimes and mm-hmm. uh, Suzanne. Mm-hmm. Uh, and before it truly leapfrogged, as you know, lately to um, South Beach. Mm-hmm. In the late 80s, nearly not. Yep, I remember it all. I went from working at the Mutiny to working at Cats, and that's where we all migrated to. Um, who do you think so is the... Cats run by Suzanne? Suzanne? Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yes, I remember her very well. She was a very successful woman. Uh, what is the... Who's the most unbelievable person? Like the, That's a story that was almost hard for you to digest, that you thought, oh, this can't be real. Ricardo Monkey Morales. Okay. And I'll tell you, his ghost lingers in Miami, uh, you know, 38 years after he was killed. This was a romantic, a triple agent, a, a, a person with a photographic memory, a leader of literary history, to some who was an assassin, a bomber, a prolific informant, cocaine dealer. And he, to me, and I've become friends with his son and his family, and they kind of reunited in the wake of the book. He, to me, was a, a metaphor for everything that has gone wrong between the United States and Cuba. This is a person who originally worked for Fidel Castro, left the country, came here, was trained by the CIA to storm, uh, storm the place. It didn't work out, so the Cubans started bombing each other in the late 60s. Then they turned to drug smuggling. He ends up heartbroken at the mutiny. He was a lost spy and a lost soldier, kind of effectively on a suicide mission by the time he held court at the mutiny. Mm-hmm. And I'm still haunted by it. I, you know, His mm-hmm. son texts me almost really pictures of his father in the condo, oh. the PTSD stories that the waitresses shared with me, and oh. differentiating the shadow and the persona of a person just so brutal. A lot of people say he's the most infamous man in Miami history. Hmm. Um, and to know him, to know him that, that when I learned his story, I said, I need to have this. Hmm. I, you know what? I, in all the times that I envisioned that I could try to attempt what you have accomplished about writing this book, I had this thing in my mind because, you know, we didn't have social media years and years ago because, you know, we're talking 35 years ago that I had this idea. But um, I used to say, I'm going to have to put a billboard on US1 to try to get anybody to call me. So how did you go about getting people to contact you? I've repressed the memory, frankly. It was so difficult. <laughs> I, tried, I compared doing this book to like passing a five pound kidney stone. It was very difficult. I, but when I, I had all the stuff, when I had all the stuff and I was ready to write it and, and pound it out, it came out. Mm-hmm. And I got just enough information from people, just enough stuff on the record, right. just enough stuff to interpolate from informant records, just enough stuff to recreate almost with artificial intelligence what this person said to a cop. That's and great. You know, it would be perfect if the Falcon and uh, Magusa were able to participate, but they weren't. And a yeah. lot of people back then are still afraid and they don't want to yeah. come out and admit sure. it. And I did the best with what I could get. You did a great job. I, I wanted to ask you, did you, uh, this was another thing I thought of when I had the idea. Did you have to go to, to prison? Did you interview anybody that was incarcerated? 
I did, and I also used the system, the prison email system, which I did. Well, I was able to email with Sal Macruta before they shut him off okay. with all the emails. Wow, and, that's great. Um, I wrote people in prison. I saw them in prison. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I think that when you show yourself, I think the lesson to me, instead of getting heartbroken if somebody slams the door, is to always leave the card there and always impress upon people the journalists that, listen, I'm here, however and whatever much you need me. If mm-hmm. you ever want to talk, if you ever just want to ask me what I'm doing, I'll have a no things attached bagel to you, with you. And I'm attaching my reputation to this. I'm not going to burn you. Mm-hmm. I'm not in this book to burn anyone. Mm-hmm. I'm in this book to bring the place back to life. And once word got around that I was discreet enough mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. like that, sure. people people helped me. And I think people regret a lot of them that told me to buzz off. Mm-hmm. I'm like, oh, I thought you were just some tabloid reporter. That's why I hope, I pray that the film, the TV series right. gets done. Because so much was left on the cutting room floor. Yeah, you'll have more to build. Yeah, that's great. How, yeah. how exciting. Yeah, because it's a story that yeah. doesn't end, and there are still people to find. There, there are thousands of people. So do you want to hear an interesting thing that nobody gave me confirmation on? The Eagles recorded next door at uh, Bayshore Recording. And um, they partied at the hotel. They slept around at the hotel. And you look at the lyrics because of, of Hotel California, mirrors on the ceiling, pink champagne on ice. Mm-hmm. And uh, one of the one of the guys, uh, one of the, the guitarists, I believe, he gave an interview, I think, to the Palm Beach Post in 1994. And he said, it should have been called the Hotel Miami or Coconut Grove because that's what kind of inspired it. Mm. Um, and I could never get anybody to tell me that Hotel California and all these guys were hooked up was actually the Hotel Beach. Mm-hmm. But I think I suspect there's a lot of that between the the, the, the waitresses that slept with the the, the, the people, you know, the, the members of the mutiny, uh, all the stuff that Don Felder has told the press, um, their relationship with uh, Smyzak and Bayshore recording next door. So that would have been something, but uh, nobody could confirm it for me. Mm. Did you ever meet Burton in person? I did. I went and met him at his home in mm. the Bay Area and mm. then visited me once in New York. And right. he... He was very skeptical, like, why are you throwing Scarface around? This is about me. This is about mm, yeah. sex and boy meets girl. And he hated being told about the drug deal. Mm. Even though everybody knew it was the, it was why people were interested and it was the majority of the business. For him, he was like, I was just creating a film set. Mm-hmm. I was a visionary. I can but just truth be told, Landon, you know, he was hardly there. And the thing was true. a while, it's wild that he wasn't there. That was probably by choice. <laughs> Yeah. The, the less he knew, the better it was. Yeah, but he would call and have the managers terrified to get a phone by the kids every night and he'd tell them how the flicker was sold, how the food was sold. Oh, yeah. When he would visit, he realized to sell it uh, by 1982, 1983 because he'd come and tour the place and he'd see just people with empty glasses with ice in it. Yeah. He's like, get these ice suckers off my table. Right. He wanted people in there spending and drinking. And by the time his resident, uh, astrologist iris salt has told us to sell oh it. yeah she did. i met her oh my gosh i can't believe yeah, you're saying that name her husband her husband had a gun and ran the liquor room can you believe the liquor room was protected with a shotgun <laughs> <laughs> yes they had some good stuff in there <laughs> i actually drank so my, he said, my first my first sip of lafitte was was at the mutiny that tasted was, really was good and so because because iris told the virgin salad and i'm just you know i talked to her she's very sweet yeah, uh, I don't that's know if she incredible. Away, she was much older. Oh, she was an old lady. Uh, but, but she stayed alive, I think, in well into her 90s. And he sold. Huh. Did we lose you? It's an amber alert. Oh. That's exactly what it is. We are receiving an Amber Alert um, while we are talking to Robin okay. Farzad. Robin, we, we had gotten an Amber Hello? Alert. Yeah, we got an Amber Alert on our phone. So it, it just... Oh, it, boy. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> so go ahead. I thought it was Iris Salzman, you know, <laughs> telegraphing for the great job. <laughs> I'll never forget meeting her. She was quite something. <laughs> <laughs> and when I called her, and when I called her, this was like about four or five years ago, she might still be alive. Mm-hmm. Uh, when I called her, she's like, I feel it. I feel that you have been waiting. I have waited for your call for 40 years. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I felt that I felt this deep connection to that property. And it has haunted my dreams nightly. And I so tried to great. be great. And I envy, I envy, Lainey, that you can just go back and conjure what the smell and the, the place mm-hmm. was. Because for me, I have to create a, you know, narratively from oral history what it was like. No, There's you very can... little photographic record. There's no video record. Yes. 
Yeah, imagine if they had cell phones. I mean, you know, it's a totally different time. That's the thing. Everything's so documented today. Well, we had those bricks back then. But they didn't have any cameras. Right, phone. no cameras. And you never took a Willie picture Lopez, in there. Willie, yeah, Willie Lopez, the bouncer, said if he ever caught anybody with a camera in there, he was instructed to pull out oh. the film. Yeah, totally. You know, uh, wow. that, that, it was a private club for, for not, you know, hitmen, mm-hmm. foremen, CIA. There's a very good chance that it was a CIA property. When you think back on it, mm-hmm. when the number of Nicaraguan, you know, cabinet members who fled the country got jobs there and uh, the, the head bouncer's job and his fate. But you never know. I mean, everybody, they, the running joke in Miami is that they said every cocaine dealer that was busted for the day, he'd say, but I was looking for the CIA. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, it always blurred legality from what was illicit. It was their safe space. Uh, you know, I want to tell yeah. you, Robin, you can call me anytime. I'll talk to you ad nauseum about this because I, I just love it. And I just am so excited that you accomplished this. It's so great. Well, I'm so grateful that you're, on, you're active on the site. And, you know, anybody can buy the book at hotelscarface.com. Uh, we have yes. relationships with both Fountain Books and Books and Books if you want an autographed version. Okay. I mean, to me, it's just a, it's a passion project. I'm so happy that I was able to, everything from cover to back, write the book that I wanted to write. That's great. And also you can find him at hashtag Hotel Scarface on Instagram. And we also have a Facebook page for the people who worked at the mutiny that he runs. So if anybody listening is um, connected to us, please, you know, put in your message to get on our site because we would love to find you. Is there anything else? No, I'm good. Um, I, I mean, I, I can talk about this all day. Anybody <laughs> who wants to reach out and talk about Hotel Scarface, I would, I would do it for a living if I could. <laughs> it just, it's amazing stories. You, you can't even uh, conjure any of this stuff up. You had to be there. It's, it's amazing that this took place in Miami. Um, it, it's just an incredible. You, again, you can't make this stuff up. <laughs> That's what I said. When I, when I realized that the truth is stranger than fiction, I have to have it. Yes, and our Facebook uh, group is called The Mutiny Club, just so you know. Yep. Anything else, Robin? So we'll let you go. No, I, I appreciate it. If you know anybody who wants to translate it into Spanish, that's one of my pet peeves. It, oh, it, it okay. got picked up in the U.K. and it's in the United States, but no Spanish-speaking countries ever picked up the book. Okay. And, and readers in those countries have reached out. So if you know any, I mean, Interesting. Yeah, that's something I'll put in my yeah. thinking cap. Great. Yeah, anything yeah. to help get the word out, because I, I just think it's so fantastic what you did. And we really appreciate Thanks. you being on our show. It's really great to talk means to the, you. Means the world means the world to me to know you. And once we get past this whole mm-hmm. pandemic, we'll throw another party down there. <laughs> that would be great. <laughs> fantastic. <laughs> All right, All Robin. Right. Thank you so much Thank for you. being on The Scoop on Miami today. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for having me. Okay. Bye. You bet. Bye. All right. What a great guest. You know, I am so uh, into this book because I can clearly remember uh, so much uh, of the late 70s and early 80s, which was a really a wild time. Hey, look, when we come back, uh, we have the next guest. We're going to go visit A&M Comic Book and books. They're a 46-year-old, second oldest comic book store in the country. And that's when we get back to The Scoop on Miami. I'm Lainey Rada, a leading edge broker associate with Douglas Elliman. I have over 35 years of experience in market cycles to bring to every transaction. And I'm still alive. When you want to see how I sell 85% of my listings and the average agent sells 40%, we need to talk. I break records, the fastest sale, the most offers, the highest price per square foot. Which one do we want to accomplish? My company includes superior quality marketing to enhance your property and the worldwide exposure, which matters in Miami. If you want to buy, I'm a Miami native. I know the area extremely well. Put my negotiating skills to work. I'm the only Laney Rada in the world, so it's easy to find me. But I'll help you. My phone number is 305-710-8558. That's 305-710-8558. Let's set up a time to talk. From this moment on, consumers will expect it and sellers will demand it. Cinematic video walkthroughs for all of your listings. 
professional photography, cinematic video walkthroughs, on-camera video tours, and professional voiceover narration. I'm Ernie Emad, head of BlueHourStudios.com. Blue Hour Studios is a progressive visual and audio powerhouse producing high-end video and audio productions. Become an expert in your field with a professionally produced podcast from our studio in Coral Gables. Call Blue Hour Studios today to elevate your image and voice. BlueHourStudios.com <laughs> We're back with more of The Scoop on Miami. Find our podcast on iTunes and on YouTube as a video. Yeah. Our Facebook page and the scoop on Miami.com. While there, don't forget to subscribe, share, and like our podcast channel. And now, here's Ernie Enag and Lady Rada. Welcome back to The Scoop on Miami. We are, have an exciting program still to come. We had a great interview with Robin Farzad, the author of Hotel Scarface. And boy, what stories did we get to, um, to listen to. Um, and also that uh, Lainey worked at the mutiny during that time. But I just love his enthusiasm and his passion for this is obviously how he got this all together. Because uh, that, that is what it takes. Yes, it is. It's exactly what it takes. We are, um, hey, by the way, don't forget scoopmiami.com where you can see every single one of our episodes um, uh, like you could on YouTube. You can also listen to our podcast there at Scoop on Miami as well as anywhere you find your favorite podcast. Just make sure you follow, share, and like our podcast. Correct? And we, subscribe. Uh, subscribe, you bet. Hey, look, we're going now to our second guest. And uh, he is, you want to introduce him? He's a special guy. Go ahead. You know, when I was really excited because uh, Lainey had uh, told me um, that we were going to go to see George Perez being in real estate. I said, what high rise are we going to go talk about? And it turned out to be um, the comic book store, which is equally exciting. Um, it is the second oldest comedy store uh comedy um comic a comic book. book store in the country i think the first one is actually a newsstand and it's 46 years old and well let's go ahead and meet uh george now at uh a and m comics welcome to the scoop on miami we're in a really historic nostalgic place in south florida a and m comics located on bird road right off of 67th avenue been here for over 40 years and we're here with the owner and we are so grateful that he's given us the opportunity to walk into a museum. It is just a spectacular place and I'm Ernie Emad, the broker owner of One Premier International and I am standing alongside my co-host. I am Lainey Rada, Leading Edge Broker Associate with Douglas Elliman. And let us introduce to you the owner of this fantastic place. George Perez. I'm George Perez, a <laughs> and Comics uh, salesperson. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. So, so George, A&M is the second oldest comic book store in the country. I believe the oldest new is a newsstand, if, I'm, uh, if some of my research is correct. What an incredible opportunity to own such a piece of Americana. What can you tell our viewers about your ownership of this fantastic place? I have been the owner and caretaker of A&M Comics since 1990 and we are a store that emphasizes on customer service and trying to fulfill the needs of our clientele. That's fantastic. So let me ask you, what was the rarest or what has been the rarest piece that you have come across in your 40 something years? I've had comic book art. I've had a Superman number one. Mm. I had a Superman number three and a number five that were signed by Siegel and Schuster, mm. which were the creators of Superman. You never know because there's so many different categories of rarity, but I would say that comic book art, since it's one of a kind, would probably be the rarest. Mm. Oh, fantastic. Let me tell you, uh, this place is like a box of chocolate. You can spend hours here. You just will never know what you're going to find. And I know that you know where everything is. But let me ask you a curious question. Have you ever been searching through the store and come across a spectacular surprise that 
you for, had forgotten about? Constantly. <laughs> you never know because when we buy large collections, you take out the what we consider the best stuff at the time. And as time goes on, certain things become uh, more collectible. And then all of a sudden you have the first appearance that's really rare, which maybe five years earlier wasn't as sought after. And now all of a sudden you have a very collectible and desirable book in stock. Huh. Well, that, that uh, brings me to a question about how you acquired all of these things. Do, do people come to you as um, they bring like family possession or do people get things that they don't want anymore? Or, you know, how does, how does the average person come to you to try to trade with you? All of those things. And we do auctions. We go to shows. We do flea markets, garage sales, oh, okay. but since we've been here for 46 and a half years, a lot of past collectors, once they start downsizing mm -hmm. or once they want to move, they usually come with their collections and they sell it back to us. Oh, okay. And, and uh, I, I see the store's been open that, you know, for the, uh, the lengthy amount of time. And uh, who did you, wh where did you come into that history? I worked for the original owners, which were Arnold and Maxine Square. Um, unfortunately, Arnold had gotten sick and my father had passed away. So I came to cancel my subscription <laughs> and Arnold um, had just gotten this news that he had to go to a doctor in New York called Sloan Kettering. Mm -hmm. So he asked me to run the store for him for three to four months. Unfortunately, he did not make it. And then the store was offered to me, but I was only 19, too much responsibility. So Michael Goldstein bought it. I worked for him for three years. Then he sold it to Tony Ortega. And then he owned it for two and a half years. And when he decided to sell it in 1990, I ended up buying it on September 13th, 1990. And, and um, so did you work here all that time, all through all the different owners? Yeah. Oh, I was, like I said, I worked for the original owners. Wow, this is like, this is like uh, your home away from home in a big way. I have figured out that I have opened up the door over 10,000 times for business. Oh, interesting That's, statistic. Uh, yeah, that is an incredible <laughs> statistic. So let me ask you, we normally start with uh, trying to find out a little bit about each of our guests. Tell us a little bit about you as a person. I know that you were interested in comic books since you were a little kid and now you own a comic book store. Um, tell us a little bit about you, your upbringing, and what brought you really the passion um, to reading comic books. I was born in New York. Uh, my parents immigrated from Cuba. They went to New York and then because of my health, because I had asthma, we had to move down here. Mm. When we moved down here, uh, my health improved 100%. And collecting, I, I wasn't, I was, as a child, I was a collector because I liked uh, seashells, I liked interesting stones, arrowheads. But the reason I got into so much reading is because every night after my dad, who worked very hard, and my mom was a housewife, and she had three children and a house to run, right before going to bed they each read their books in bed so when we would go say good night you would always see them with those 10 15 20 minutes that they had to themselves reading before going to bed and it always stuck in my mind reading must be interesting or enjoyable for them to do that with the very few minutes they had to themselves I love that story, and that is exactly how children grow up to be readers, is by seeing their parents read. That's fantastic. You are not <laughs> kidding, and what a great, because back then there wasn't all of these uh, online or uh, Nintendos electronic and books. electronic games that people mm -hmm. are uh, reading is such a healthy, uh, wonderful way, and I suggest that if you're a parent, 
uh, specifically a baby boomer like I am, and you grew up around comic books, that you bring your young kids here uh, and explore uh, what something that many kids may have never visited is a comic book store. Uh, and I am assured that it's one way of getting kids today to begin reading and a few hours off of the computer. Well, uh, have you heard? that uh, I've heard this from a long time ago if you because we have a, a very um, a, a big Hispanic population over 25 percent in Miami and that one way to learn how to speak English and to read is to read comic books because of the, the limited vocabulary have you ever heard that yes um, reading and to draw mm, a lot yeah, of young definitely. children will read the comics to learn better English and or to learn how to draw because they enjoy the art and then they try to copy it. Yeah, for sure. yeah that's a, a unique skill too, right? So right. Let, let, I'm a numbers guy. Uh, approximately how many comic books are within this, these confines? Over 80,000. Over 80,000 comic books. And they range in prices from where to where? A um, dollar to a dollar fifty up to thousands of dollars. Mm -hmm. Now folks, where can you walk out with your kids for a few dollars and give them such enjoyment of reading uh, comic books? Now I know that during the pandemic, uh, Marvel and DC, which I believe are the largest uh, printers and producers of this material, had stopped. But while we were off the air, you told me that they began printing again. Is that correct? Correct. For the first time in forever, in March, 15th or March 20, they stopped printing comic books for the first time in the United States. And then back in May, they started up again after a three month hiatus. Do you think that there's been a surge in interest or any change have you seen from, from all of the superhero movie uh, organizations, you know, of everything that's come out for these last couple of years? It has gone in more fans, mm -hmm. but it depends on the movie. Mm -hmm. Like when it's a classic character like Captain America mm -hmm. or Iron Man and stuff, they pretty much sell themselves. But like with Guardians of the Galaxy, that created a whole new fan base mm -hmm. with the two movies that have come out. Okay. So realistically, the driving force for new comic books and to stir new interest is based on Hollywood and the movie making industry. Well, right now, comic book movies are very trending. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, some directors don't like it, mm -hmm. like Scorsese, he says that Marvel movies are hurting the movie industry, but as long as you get somebody to go see a movie, that I think is the end game of the movie industry. And I want to mention that in this store, we're talking, we've talked a lot about comic books, but there's tons of memorabilia. It's also a toy store, a collectible store. When he said um, Iron Man, uh, you know, uh, Captain America, uh, I, I'm staring at a Captain America shield. So you can get things that are very small and things that are very big here. Anything you can think of, I think, is here. We have Captain America action figures, cups, seven up cups from the 70s. We have lunch boxes, statues, a little bit of everything for everybody's price range. So what would you consider is the most unique item in the store? Laney. <laughs> oh my goodness. I, thought... I didn't even pay for that. Oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> so what? I would imagine she's going to stay here Cuban. <laughs> because uh, I was going to buy her on my way out. I, I came here and said, I'm going to get the most expensive item on the, on the menu. Oh and it turned out to be Lainey. Unbelievable. Oh, She's not for sale. <laughs> she is a keeper. That's fantastic. Well, you know, Lainey brought one of her so keepsake possessions of hers. Uh, one, because it has her name. Well, you know what? I'm going to let Lainey describe what she brought. No, I just, I, I dug out of, out of some stack of boxes my Superman comic book. To Let's bring show here everyone. because I said this is the only comic book I ever collected, and it's and it's a uh, 12 center, which means something, doesn't it, George? What does that mean? It's around 1968 to about 1971. Right, and then also um, the other thing to look for when you're collecting is the volume number, right? Well, there were 
they weren't yes. any several volumes at that time. Mm -hmm. Now, Superman might have like three or four volumes. Back then, there was only one Superman. So, I, I love the yeah. title of the, uh, of the book. Can you tell us the title of the book? Oh, you mean of the, the, uh, of the, the comic episode. Book. Yes. Great imaginary novel, Superman's Tragic Marriage. <laughs> and, uh, and, the, and the thing that's interesting about it, too, is that her name is spelled L-A-N-I-E on the cover, but everywhere in the, in the book is spelled L-A-N-E-Y, like my name is spelled. But it's just something fun that I have that I don't think it's worth a lot of money, is it, George? In that condition, wait, it's not, hold on. Let's wait for the drum roll. <laughs> and now, what is it? In that condition, in the industry, we call it well loved. <laughs> oh, that's beautiful. It, it, because it still has a value. But it's still just special to me, just because it has my name on it. And I and I, and most people never know that Superman and Lois Lane have a daughter named Laney. Yes. And well, that's, that's why I like it. See, and that's the discrepancy. Sometimes, the artist who did the cover. It's not the same artist who did the interior. Mm -hmm. mm. That's why they have two different spellings of the name. Oh, Very that's great! Great to learn. I'm sure there's so many things to learn here. So, folks, I I was asking uh, uh, George earlier if he has an online presence. The way to get these comic books is in person because that's really the best way to experience them. And you may come for something and walk out with several other things because... It's full it, of surprises here. It really is. It's, it's like going on a scavenger hunt and, and, and finding these uh, uh, memory uh, trips that take you back to memory lane. What, uh, George, um, is there anything that we may have failed to ask you uh, during this interview that you may want to tell our viewers and listeners? We are your neighborhood comic book store that loves questions, loves to answer them, and we try to give the best customer service possible, and we hope to see you soon. I, I just think it's just like all kinds of fun to come here. So I, I just think we didn't ask something. What's the oldest thing that you have here right now? Let me choose now, don't that. Don't say it's me again. <laughs> Let me <Okay>. choose the, <laughs> that answer wisely. <laughs> I think the oldest thing we have here are some magazines from the 1850s okay. called Puck Magazine. They're bound editions. They're beautiful. I was looking at them. But we have um, Life Magazines from the 10s and 20s, Life Magazines from the 30s. Okay. We have Disney Comics from the 40s and 50s. Mm. A little bit of everything. That is for sure. A little bit of everything. It definitely applies to this store. And although you could hear my voice, I know you can't see me on screen uh, because there is so much memorabilia here that it is just a fantastic place uh, to come. Uh, finally, what are your hours? How many days a week are you open? We're open six days a week, Monday through Saturday, 12 to 7. Sunday, 12 to 5, and we are closed Tuesdays. Oh, and don't you have some special event? We are now participating in Free Comic Book Day, mm -hmm. which usually is the first Saturday of May, but because of the pandemic, mm -hmm. okay. and they've been doing it from July 15th to September 15th. Okay. Every week, one to two or three titles come out and then we hand them out to the customers. Is there a specific day of the week that they can come and visit the store for that uh, free comic book day? <laughs> Wednesdays are new books day so okay. usually that day. Okay. Fantastic. Uh, otherwise your phone number is 305-661-3406 and we are located at 6650 Southwest 48th Street also known as Bird Road. Thank you so much for indulging us and letting us come visit the store and interview you and hope to share uh, your business and get more exposure for you. Thank you so much, and it was a pleasure. <laughs> Thank you for being on The Scoop on Miami. Okay, what a, we had, look, it was just a blast. We had a great time. He was a fun guy, no question. Um, my goodness, the amount of uh, stuff that's there is uh, Take your kids and get lost in there um, uh, with something very healthy and, and very good to do. Um, I know Lainey wants to say a couple words. No, I, I brought, can, is my mic on? Yes, it is. Okay. I don't know, it sounds different. Um, I, no, I have my comic book here, and I want to tell you, this is a 50-year-old comic book, and you know what? It's worth like between 5 and $10. So, 
So keep that in mind when you're keeping all of these things in your house and storage and paying for all that. Um, it's the only comic book I kept because it has my name on it, but there's the, those little things that, he, that I mentioned and that he verified. It's uh, how much it cost because they started at 10 cents and then those, are, those show what year it is. And then there's also the number, there's a number on the cover and there are just 200 of the most valuable comic books in the world. So um, you can dig through your stuff. I mean, they're definitely fun and everything, but if you think you're going to retire, you better check it out. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're going to take one quick little break, and then we're going to come back with Lainey Rada's 305 Hidden Treasures. With hundreds of brokerages, thousands of agents, how do you cut through all the noise? One Premier International Realty, a boutique real estate brokerage located in Coral Gables, doing business the old-fashioned way, putting people first, buying, selling, or leasing residential and commercial properties in Miami-Dade, Broward, and Monroe counties. One Premier International provides each customer a high level of service and communication experience with full-time agents from around the world bringing their unique sense of business skills and a foreign customer base. One Premier International Realty. You've heard of private banking, now experience private brokerage, a higher level of service and knowledge. One Premier International Realty. 305-669-0233 or go online to www.onepremierinternational.com We're back with more of The Scoop on Miami. Find our podcast on iTunes and on YouTube as a video. Our Facebook page and the scoop on Miami.com. While there, don't forget to subscribe, share, and like our podcast channel. And now... Here's Ernie Enoch and Lady Rada. Welcome back to The Scoop on Miami. Glad to have you along. Um, we are now going to go into our uh, 305's Hidden Treasure, and that's a segment that Lainey Rada does every single week. Lainey, tell us about today's 305 Hidden Treasure. Well, I try to pair up the uh, places that we have to sort of uh, go with the show. And for some reason, I thought of Shark Valley <laughs> because of all the sharks. <laughs> In the old days, uh, you had to swim like a shark to, to navigate. But uh, the, I always also find out new things about places. And again, I always have to give the disclosure that a lot of these places, unfortunately, are not open. You have to double check before you go. But fun things. And uh, the most... Special thing I found out about Shark Valley is that it is open 24 hours, and I had no idea. So enter at your own risk if you go <laughs> in the dark. But anyway, it would be interesting. So let's go to Lainey Rada's 305's Hidden Treasures. And now it's time for the 305, the 305 Hidden Treasures, Hidden Treasures with Lainey Rada. There is a great adventurous destination in the Everglades. One of the best ways to get the closest to nature is 25 miles west of the Turnpike at 36000 Southwest 8th Street. Right off the Tamiami Trail, you can visit Shark Valley that's open 24 hours a day. It's not about sharks though. This 15 mile loop is 20 feet wide. You can bring your own bike, rent a bike, take a two hour tram ride, or you can walk. There are ranger led tours, including one under the full moon. There is seminal history you can read up on about this spot. The path was constructed in 1946 when oil drilling was attempted. It turned out not to be economically feasible, so they left this area to the National Park Service. It doesn't contain standing water all year round, but that's what makes it unique. There is just a smooth path with a fantastic observation tower. Edward Gessie designed the 45-foot high tower with the best expansive view. The river of grass is as far as the eye can see. Come observe ibis, wood storks, roseate spoonbills, raccoons, and white-tailed deer in the sawgrass vegetation. This open space lets all the nature run free. It's seasonably submerged with large expanses of oolitic limestone, undoubtedly the 
best bike trail in South Florida. The most incredible thing to see are alligators of all sizes laying out while you pass by. Dozens. The trail is a hidden treasure, but the alligators are everywhere. It's an unforgettable experience. Shark Valley. We were talking, it must have been junior high days or something the last time I went there. It is, absolutely. Uh, go ahead and press your little button because I pressed it for you by mistake. Um, now we're okay. back on. Now you can hear um, me. Hey, look, we've come to the end of a scoop on Miami uh, with two great uh, guests this week. And next week, we have an exciting show. Tell us about it, Lainey. We are going to be featuring Goodwill Industries, and we're going to talk to the CEO, David Landsberg. David's been around uh, in Miami forever, and I've known him almost forever. But he used to be the C, the he used to be um, oh my gosh I forget what his position is but at the Miami Herald for a really long time and publisher so, uh, no okay so anyway um, then we're also going to have so we're going to have David Landsberg the CEO of, in, of Goodwill Industries and we're also gonna, going to have Olga Lamaran she's the partner of Anna Trias and they're going to be talking to us about Florana which is their florist shop in South Miami. Yes, so small business, big business, and mm -hmm. obviously Goodwill does just incredibly great things, um, no, not just in our own community, but across the country and the world. Right, David wants to talk more about the things that people might not realize that they're responsible for and what they try to help the community with, so it's important, especially now. You bet. Hey, don't forget to go to scooponmiami.com where you can watch all of our programs, but you'll also be able to go to the guest links pages and link into any one of our guests and support our small businesses and specifically the guests that we've had on the program. And then look for the podcast everywhere you find your favorite podcast. Lainey, what else do you have going on? That's it. That is it. Thank you so much for joining us on The Scoop on Miami. Thank and you. And we'll see you again next week. We hope you're entertained, informed, enriched, and proud to live in Miami. We have come to the end of another episode of The Scoop on Miami with your host, Ernie Emad, broker, owner of One Premier International Realty, and Lainey Rada, a leading edge broker associate with Douglas Elliman. Thank you for riding alongside our journey. If you know of a special person doing wonderful things in our community or want your business featured, visit thescooponmiami.com and contact us. Find The Scoop on Miami on iTunes. Subscribe, share, and like our podcast channel. While there, leave a comment. We'd love to know what you think. And now you have The Scoop on Miami.